all fly away together. Into the forever. And beautiful sky. Hey, welcome back to Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy. Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 is coming out real soon, and it's going to be the final chapter in this outstanding trilogy. So, we are here to recap everything you need to know about the Guardians of the Galaxy so far, including Volumes 1 and 2 and all the other films they appeared in or that are relevant to them. Alright, so let's start from the beginning and recap the story that you need to know about the Guardians of the Galaxy. He says, welcome to the frickin' Guardians of the Galaxy. Only he didn't use frickin'. So, a million years ago, a Celestial named Ego came into existence. Yeah, I wasn't kidding, we are starting at the very beginning. The Celestials are cosmic gods that may have created the universe. Ego is an outlier though, him being just a living planet and being born all by himself. Ego was lonely, so he created an avatar for himself and started traveling the universe. But he was disappointed with what he found, so he decided to remake the universe in his own image. He planted his seeds in every world that he visited. Ego's plan was to transform every planet into him. It's a process he called the expansion. However, to activate his cosmic makeover, he needed an offspring. So Ego slept with a lot, and I mean a lot, of alien women and made tons of kids. Did you make a penis? Dude. What is wrong with you? If he's a planet, how could he make a baby with your mother? He would smush her. However, Ego couldn't physically stay away from his planet for too long. This is why he hired a space pirate named Yandu Undada to bring him his kids once they were grown up. None of Ego's kids carries a celestial gene, meaning that they could not activate the expansion, so he killed them. Psycho. All of them except one special star boy. In 1980, Ego fell in love with Meredith Quill. After Peter Quill was born, Ego had to return to his planet, so Meredith raised Peter alone. With every visit back to Earth, though, Ego was worried that his love for Meredith would prevent him from accomplishing his mission, so he gave her brain cancer. What? In 1988, Meredith died. Now, Peter couldn't handle his mother dying, so he ran away, but then he was abducted by Yondu. Instead of taking Peter to Ego, Yondu decided to keep him with his crew. That's after discovering what Ego was actually doing with all of his kids. So, Yondu raised Peter like his own son, and Peter became a space pirate called a Ravager. At some point, Peter started calling himself Star-Lord, and he got his own ship called the Milano, named after his childhood crush, Alyssa Milano. Now, many years earlier, the Mad Titan Thanos predicted the annihilation of his people, but they didn't take him seriously, and so his planet, Titan, was destroyed by overpopulation. After that, Thanos began killing 50% of all the people in every world in the universe. He believed that if half the universe was dead, then the rest of it would be saved. Thanos massacred half of these green people, and then he decided to adopt a girl who showed bravery against his soldiers, and that girl was Gamora. Thanos raised Gamora to be the best assassin in the galaxy, and she became his favorite daughter. Now, sometime later, Thanos got another daughter, Nebula, not his favorite daughter. Now, at first, Gamora and Nebula formed a strong bond to the point that they actually considered one another to be sisters. However, Thanos forced them to constantly fight to test their abilities, and Gamora always won these fights. Every single time Nebula failed, Thanos replaced part of her body with the cybernetic. Nebula grew to hate Gamora for never sparing her this endless torture. And at some unknown date, a raccoon named Subject 89P13 was taken by a being called the High Evolutionary, who genetically and cybernetically enhanced his body. And at some point, he either escaped or was freed, and he became Rocket, a badass genius mercenary. Afterwards, Rocket became partners in crime with Groot, a Flora Colossus from Planet X. That's a talking tree who can only say three words. I am Groot. At some point, Thanos starts working with a guy named Ronan the Accuser. Now, Ronan is a Kree fanatic who refused to accept the peace treaty between the Kree Empire and the Nova Empire, who had just wrapped up a thousand-year war together. Ronan left the Kree and formed an alliance with Thanos so he could destroy Xandar, the home planet of the Xandarian Empire. Also, in the 1990s, Ronan almost destroyed Earth, but Carol Danvers, aka Captain Marvel, stopped him. Under Thanos' orders, Ronan massacred half the people on Kylos. He himself killed a woman named Ovette and her daughter, Chimera. Now, these were the wife and daughter of a warrior named Drax the Destroyer, and Drax vows to kill Ronan and everybody that Ronan is connected to. So, around this time, Thanos sent Gamora and Nebula to serve as Ronan's personal warriors because he has just given Ronan the task of acquiring an orb that contains the Power Stone. This is one of the six Infinity Stones. Now, this particular stone grants its wielder immense cosmic energy that can destroy an entire planet. Basically, it's like a tiny portable Death Star. I can't believe you had that in your purse! Now, Thanos wants the Infinity Stones because, with their cosmic power, he could just snap his fingers and turn 50% of all life to dust. Yondu is hired to steal the same orb from Morag. Peter betrays Yondu and steals that orb for himself. Why does it do that? Well, maybe it's because ever since he was a kid, Yondu kept threatening Peter that his crew was going to eat him. Normal people don't even think about eating someone else. 
much less that person ever to be grateful for it. Peter does a dance and steals the orb, barely escaping Ronan's forces, forcing Yondu to put a bounty on Peter's head. Gamora volunteers to go after Star-Lord, but she actually wants to get the orb for herself and sell it because she no longer wants to be responsible for the deaths of billions of people. Essentially, she sees the orb as an out to stop working for her dad, Thanos. Gamora attacks Peter, but then Rocket and Groot show up to collect the bounty on Peter, and then they're all arrested by space cops called the Nova Corps. In space prison, they meet Drax, who wants to kill Gamora because of her connection to Ronan. When the other prisoners are about to execute Gamora, Peter convinces Drax to spare her by using the power of metaphor. Metaphors are gonna go over his head. Nothing goes over my head. My reflexes are too fast. I would catch it. Gamora reveals that she has a buyer who's willing to pay a lot of space money for the orb, so these misfits work together to escape prison, but not before Peter takes back his Walkman. That seems like a lot of work. Why does it do that? Well, Walkman has sentimental value for him because it was a gift from his mother before she died. Music is at the heart and soul of these movies. Ronan meets with Thanos and kills his right-hand man, but Thanos just kind of belittles him and doesn't actually do anything about it. Oh, what a loser! So, the misfits arrive on a planet called Nowhere, which is actually the severed head of a celestial, and there they meet the buyer for the orb, who is revealed to be the Collector. He's a cosmic guy who collects stuff. Now, before the Guardians meet the Collector, Peter and Gamora share a moment, and there's this unspoken romance between them for just a second. And at the same time, Rocket and Drax try to kill each other because Drax has no tact, and Rocket is just tragic. Well, I didn't ask to get made! I didn't ask to be torn apart and put back together over and over and turned into some, some little monster! Finally, the Guardians, minus Drax, meet with the Collector, and he gives them, and us, exposition about the Infinity Stones. One of the Collector's slaves, Karina, decides to use the Power Stone to kill her terrible master. However, only powerful individuals can hold an Infinity Stone in their bare hand. So the cosmic energy turns her to ash and blows up the Collector's entire place. Now, after seeing the power of the orb, Gamora wants to give it to the Nova Corps since they could protect it from Ronan. But then, just on cue, Ronan arrives. Gamora takes the Power Stone and Nebula chases her around nowhere and then into space. Drax fights Ronan, but he is no match for the Accuser who almost kills him. Nebula destroys Gamora's ship, takes the orb, and leaves her sister to die. But, you know, she feels bad about it. Peter saves Gamora, and he almost dies in the vacuum of space, proving that he is a true hero, and then he is rescued by Yondu and the Ravagers. Groot rescues Drax from drowning, and then Rocket tells Drax some really mean things that he needs to hear. Oh, boo-hoo-hoo, my wife and child are dead. <gasps> oh, I don't care if it's mean. Ronan betrays Thanos and decides to use the Power Stone for himself. Peter convinces Yondu to help them stop Ronan, and Yondu agrees because, deep down, he's not really angry at Peter, since Peter is basically his surrogate son. The misfits formulate a plan to stop Ronan, and the Guardians of the Galaxy are officially formed. Bunch of jackasses, standing in a circle. Ronan attacks Xandar, but the Guardians, the Ravagers, and the Nova Corps protect the planet. Everyone fights. Gamora defeats Nebula. Groot does some adorable murders. Ronan destroys the Nova Starships with the Power Stone. Rocket then crashes the Milano into the Dark Aster, and the ship starts blowing up as Groot sacrifices himself to save his friends. We are Groot. Now, despite everything, though, Ronan survives. He's about to destroy Xandar, but then Peter distracts him with the dance-off. This gives Rocket time to shoot his Moonbreaker gun at Ronan's hammer, and the Power Stone goes flying. Peter catches it with his bare hands, and because he's half-celestial, he can hold an Infinity Stone without going all Raiders of the Lost Ark. The Guardians hold hands, and with the power of friendship, they blow Ronan to smithereens. Afterwards, the Nova Corps keep the orb for safekeeping. The Guardians of the Galaxy fly to their next adventure, and also a new Groot is born. A new Groot? Yes, the Groot who sacrifices his life to save the Guardians is dead for real. Baby Groot is actually his son. Now this brings us to Volume 2. About two months later, the Guardians are hired by the Sovereign to protect their batteries from a multi-dimensional tentacled monster. The Sovereign are these genetically engineered golden people who are highly sensitive, so they will kill you for the slightest offense. So they're Twitter. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah, they're Twitter. In exchange for killing the space monster, the Guardians get Nebula, but then Rocket steals some of their precious, precious batteries just to stick it to them. See, basically, Rocket does everything he can to make people hate him. Why? Well, because Rocket is somebody who never really experienced love and friendship. He doesn't know how to act around people who he truly cares for and who truly care for him. He spent most of his life bitter, and now he pushes away everybody so he won't get hurt. So, the Sovereign sends a fleet to kill the Guardians, and just when it seems like they're done for, they are saved by Peter's dad, Ego, the Living Planet. I thought Yondu was your father. We've been together this whole time. You thought Yondu was my actual blood relative? 
You look exactly alike. One's blue. Ego tracked down Peter when he heard of a man from Earth who could touch an infinity stone. Ego is accompanied by Mantis, who is sort of his servant and sleeping pill, but in truth, she's actually his secret daughter, meaning Peter has a half-sister. Mantis has the ability to affect the emotions of others, and she's a pretty darn good fighter. After an awkward reunion, Ego takes Peter, Gamora, and Drax to his planet while Rocket, Baby Groot, and Nebula stay behind to fix the ship. Meanwhile, Yondu and his Ravagers are hanging out in space Amsterdam. I understood that reference. It turns out that Yondu and his crew were exiled by the other Ravagers because they broke the code to never deal with kids. She betrayed the law! Yondu meets Takar Ogord, who's one of the top Ravagers. He also rescued Yondu from slavery when he was younger. Yondu asked to be forgiven, but there is no forgiveness for breaking the code. This leads to some of the Ravagers losing faith in their captain, namely a guy named Taserface. Taserface! What was your second choice? Scrotum hat? <laughs> And right after this, Aisha, the High Priestess of the Sovereign, hires Yondu to hunt down the Guardians. But then, Rocket sets up the perfect trap and single-handedly destroys most of the Ravagers before he and Baby Groot are eventually captured by Yondu. But because Yondu loves Peter like a son, he doesn't plan to turn them over to the Sovereign. And this is the last straw for his crew. There's a mutiny led by Taserface, and even Kraglin, who's always been loyal to Yondu, turns on him. Just before a fight erupts between the Ravagers, Nebula shoots Yondu, and Taserface leads a mutiny who kills everybody who is loyal to Yondu. After this, Nebula goes after Gamora to kill her. Groot tries to free Rocket and Yondu, but after some really fun confusion, Kraglin is the one who frees them. They killed all my friends. See, he feels bad about the whole mutiny thing, and he swears allegiance to Yondu. So Yondu gets a new fin, and he goes to town on the traitors. And by the way, this scene is always way more creepy when you use music from The Shining. <laughs> Yondu controls this arrow by whistling, and this is pretty much one of the most OP weapons in the MCU, and it even lets him fly like Mary Poppins. I'm Mary Poppins, y'all! Rocket and Yondu get into an argument, and it becomes clear that they are basically the same person. So they all hurry back to Ego's planet so they can save their friends. Now while all of that happens, the other Guardians are on Ego's planet, kind of chilling out at first. So like, at first, Peter doesn't trust Ego because he abandoned him and his mother, but then they have some father and son bonding, and Peter learns that he has abilities as long as he is on Ego's planet. Drax and Manta share a heart-to-heart -heart about beauty and stuff. You are horrifying to look at, but that's a good thing. Uh -huh. When you're ugly and someone loves you, you know they love you for who you are. Now, Gamora suspects Ego's true intentions, but Peter doesn't want to hear it because he finally has the father that he never had. The two of them end up arguing about their unspoken romance, but Gamora cannot open herself up to love. Not yet. Nebula arrives and she and Gamora try to kill each other for just a little bit, but in like a fun sibling kind of way. But then Nebula almost dies for real and Gamora saves her life. Eventually they work out their issues and become sisters again. You were the one who wanted to win and I just wanted a sister. Ego finally reveals his plans to Peter, telling Peter that he killed his mom. And then he forces Peter to start the expansion, which makes all of his seeds cover the surface of the worlds with this blue flubbery kind of thingy. Yondu and Racket crash their ship into Ego and momentarily stop the expansion. The Guardians dig into the planet's core to destroy Ego's brain. But right about then, the Sovereign Fleet attacks the Guardians. Rocket gives Baby Groot a nuke to blow up Ego's brain, while the other Guardians fight off Ego, who restarts the expansion. As Peter sees his friends and family suffering, he uses his heart and unleashes his full power to fight Ego. Baby Groot remembers the right button to push, and they blow Ego's brains out. All of the Guardians escape except Peter. Yondu saves him as Ego's world implodes. But Yondu has no space protection, and in one of the saddest MCU scenes ever, Yondu gives his life to save his baby boy. He may have been your father boy, but he wasn't your daddy. Hey, you're crying. No, it's my allergy to like really good death scenes. That's not a real thing. No, I'm not. It's my allergy to really good death scenes. Shut up. So the Guardians hold a funeral for Yondu, and Peter gives a heartbreaking speech about Yondu being his Hasselhoff. I guess David Hasselhoff did kind of end up being my dad after all. Only it was you, Yondu. Rocket tells the Ravagers about Yondu's great sacrifice, so they all come to the service to send Yondu off in style. Yondu's actions also gives Dakar Ogord inspiration to reassemble their old crew, who were sort of the previous versions of the Guardians of the Galaxy. Gamora and Nebula embrace each other as sisters, but Nebula leaves to go kill Thanos. Now, in the end, Rocket understands that unless he learns from Yondu's mistakes, he will chase his family away. So, it's a story of acceptance for all the Guardians who become a family. I don't have friends. I got family. And yes, Rocket is my favorite, and that's why I'm spending so much time talking about his powerful arc. Now, after her defeat, Aisha creates a new perfect being to destroy the Guardians, and that is Adam Warlock. Kraglin's also trying to master his Finn, and Groot becomes a teenager. 
Now, four years later, Nebula attacks Thanos on his capital ship, the Sanctuary 2, but her assassination attempt failed and she was captured. Thanos accessed Nebula's memories through her cybernetics, and he discovered the Gamora knew where the Soul Stone was located. So, Thanos finally makes his moves to collect the Infinity Stones, since now he knows that he can find access to all of them. His first stop is Nidavellir. He forces the giant dwarves to forge an Infinity Gauntlet for him, a device that can hold all of the Infinity Stones in the palm of his hand. And then he kills all the dwarves, except for Eitri. Thanos only destroys his hand, so he can no longer make another Infinity Gauntlet. Thanos' next stop is Xandar. He kills half the Xandarians and takes away the Power Stone. Around that time, Asgard was also destroyed. No connection to Thanos, but the surviving Asgardians were on their way to Earth on a giant ship. But just before Asgard blew up, Loki took the Space Stone from Odin's vault. Thanos attacks the ship, kills half the people, beats up Thor and Hulk, and takes the Space Stone. Then Thanos kills Loki and blows up the ship. The Guardians of the Galaxy arrive shortly after, rescuing Thor. Thor tells them that the Reality Stone is on nowhere, so some of the Guardians go to get it, while Rocket and Groot join Thor to forge a Thanos-killing weapon on Nineveh On Nowhere, Gamora kills Thanos, but it's an illusion. Thanos already has the Reality Stone, and this was a trap, and he takes Gamora. I should also mention that Gamora and Peter had become an item by this time. I've mastered the ability of standing so incredibly still that I've become invisible to the eye. Later on, Thanos tortures Nebula, forcing Gamora to reveal that the Soul Stone was hidden on a planet called Vormir. Thanos and Gamora portal over to Vormir, where they are greeted by the guardian of the Soul Stone, the Red Skull. He was sent there by the Space Stone in World War II. Red Skull explains that the Soul Stone demands a sacrifice and that Thanos must kill the one thing that he loves. And so, even though it breaks his heart, he throws Gamora off the Vormir cliff and she dies. Thanos gets the Soul Stone, three down, three to go. On Nidavellir, Thor, Rocket, and Groot meet Eitri, and they forge Stormbreaker, an axe that can kill Thanos. Then, they arrive in Wakanda just in the nick of time to save the day. And by the way, this moment is set to the Avengers theme in the movie, but it really should have been set to Immigrant Song by Led Zeppelin from Thor Ragnarok. Mind Stone is in Vision's head, and Vision is in Wakanda, so this sets up a massive fight between the armies of Thanos and the remaining Avengers. And by the way, the Avengers are kind of broken up at this point. Like a band? Like, like the Beatles? On the Sanctuary 2, Nebula escapes and tells the other Guardians to meet her on Titan. That is Thanos' homeworld, where he plans to do the snap, since the destruction of his planet was what set him off on this quest to begin with. The remaining Guardians arrive on Titan, where they meet Iron Man, Doctor Strange, and Spider-Man. They fight for a bit, and everybody asks about Gamora. Where is Gamora? I'll do you one better. Who's Gamora? I'll do you one better. Why is Gamora? And then they join forces against Thanos, and they almost get the gauntlet off, but then he tells them that he killed Gamora. So Peter loses his shit, hits Thanos, allows him to regain control, and then he throws a freaking moon at them. Eventually, Thanos defeats all the heroes, and Doctor Strange gives up the Time Stone. Why does it do that? Well, it's all part of the plan, because Steven saw the future, and he saw that this was the only way to beat Thanos. After this, Thanos portals to Wakanda for the Mind Stone. Wanda Maximoff is forced to kill Vision to destroy the stone, but then Thanos rewinds time and gets all six Infinity Stones. Thor stops Thanos before the snap, but he doesn't go for the head, and this allows Thanos to finish what he started. 50% of all the life in the universe turns to dust. This includes Mantis Dragon. Peter and Groot. Rocket and Nebula are the only surviving Guardians. About three weeks later, Tony Stark and Nebula are stuck in space. Tony almost dies, but Captain Marvel appears and brings them to Earth. Afterwards, Nebula reveals that Thanos is on his retirement planet where he took up farming and cooking. But what was he cooking? My guess is he's making like a butternut squash style stew or a bisque. The heroes go there, but to their dismay, they discover that Thanos has reduced the stones to atoms, meaning that there is now no way to undo the snap. Thor goes for the head and finally kills Thanos. Five years later, Rocket and Nebula are still the Guardians of the Galaxy and they're part of an alliance between Earth and space heroes. Now things really suck though, and like nobody is able to move on. But then, Ant-Man returns from the quantum realm and unintentionally discovers time travel. The Avengers reassemble and they go back in time to steal the Infinity stones from the past. Although, it was more like alternate timelines that are created within time travel. You know, it doesn't matter. Time heist. A time heist? Rocket and Thor travel to 2013 and they steal the reality stone. And in the process, Rocket helps Thor overcome his trauma and guilt. You think you're the only one who lost people? I lost the only family I ever had. Nebula travels with Black Widow, Hawkeye, and War Machine to 2014 to grab the power and soul stones. So this means that Nebula and Rhodey are on Morag, back where this story actually began. They get the power stone, but right after Rhodey ports away, Nebula gets stuck in 2014. Now this happens because there are two Nebulas sharing the same time and space, and their cybernetics create a memory link between 
between them. So 2014 Nebula has access to present day Nebula's memories. Thanos captures them, gets his own recap of Infinity War, and witnesses his own death. Once he realizes that the Avengers are attempting to undo the snap, he travels with his entire army to the 2023 timeline. Now, before that, Black Widow sacrifices herself on Vormir and the Avengers get all the stones. Professor Hulk gets the stones and snaps all the dusted back into existence, including the other Guardians. Right after that, 2014 Thanos attacks with his entire army. Now, what's really important for this recap is to know that the Gamora from 2014 arrives in the present day timeline. That being said, this Gamora has never met the Guardians, so the Gamora that we knew and loved is truly gone forever. 2014 Nebula tries to kill her sister, but present day Nebula shoots her past self, which is sort of like Nebula killing the tragic and damaged part of herself, finally freeing herself from Thanos. After that, we get the portal scene. All the Avengers assemble and there is a giant battle. Now in the end, Tony sacrifices himself and snaps Thanos away with his entire army. But a deleted scene confirmed that Gamora was not dead. Somehow. But how? I think it's because Tony did not include her in the snap. Everyone else who died in the past stayed dead, not her. Why? Was it the magic cliff? I don't know. That's some freaking Infinity Stone scientist. Either way, Gamora is back, technically. However, she doesn't join the Guardians, and instead the team gets a godly upgrade with Thor. But it turns out that adding an Asgardian to the team while he's experiencing a midlife crisis, not a great idea. So the Guardians ditch him the first chance they get. And then the Guardians of the Galaxy saved Christmas. After they left Thor, the Guardians bought nowhere from the Collector. So they used the big head as their base of operations. Kraglin tells the others that Yondu ruined Christmas for Peter when he was young. So now, Drax and Mantis decide to kidnap Kevin Bacon to cheer up Star-Lord. But eventually, everything works out and Christmas is saved. I don't know what Christmas is, but Christmas time is here. But in truth, Kraglin was ill-informed because Yondu didn't ruin Christmas for Peter and he actually gifted him his quad blasters. Also, Mantis reveals to Peter that she is his half-sister and it's incredibly sweet. And that's all you need to know before Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, the final chapter of this incredible trilogy. He left out some important information, but that is the gist of it. Are you up to speed on everything or is there something that we left out? Let me know down in the comments below or at me on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe and smash that bell for alerts. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.